Welcome to Buckets, brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network, spotting a now month-old playoff beard, as I have not shaved since the Kansas City Chiefs entered the NFL playoffs, and my wife is absolutely just begging me to trim this, just begging me to get rid of uh, the length of this beard. But I will not until next Sunday uh, when the big game is, which, by the way, you can find all sorts of great content about in the Action Network app, the best way for you to track your picks, get up the second information where the bets and money are coming in on, track all. You can literally track as the as the sharps are like, OK, I'm never betting on my, against my homes again. But my power rating, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not betting against my home. But my power rate, you can see it happen in real time and figure out if you, in fact, want to back regular season numbers where the Chiefs receivers did not catch footballs or the postseason uh, stats where they, in fact, did. You can also catch all of our bets in there. You can track those, uh, as well as Brandon Anderson's futures. Brandon's going to be coming back here. It's going to be a bit. We've got to get through probably the rest of the month as he recovers from football. But we're going to do a big, like, welcome back, Brandon. He's going to ask, like, what the hell happened with things like the our grizzlies futures but our cows futures <laughs> looking good uh we're gonna cover that sometime in the future uh by the way his family's going through a rough time if you're a longtime listener he's at wheaton brando w-h-e-a-t-o-n brando b-r-a-n-d-o on twitter um if you can just send him a note of support we'd love to do that because brandon's family's going through a rough time and we want to support him by the way, if you want a live version, if you want to see my magnificent playoff beard, you can catch it at youtube.com slash the action network. We have live shows coming up for uh, basketball. Once football has ended, you're going to want to catch all our live shows for March Madness. We have so much great content and coverage. Check it out at youtube.com slash the action network. This is your best bets episode for Monday, February 5th in the association, as well as today we're going to talk about the, I, I guess the, we have the latest news on Joel Embiid. Uh, I want. I have some future stuff that we're going to have to hit on there, both for awards markets and the team future. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit of trade discussion with the Orlando Magic. I reported an article you can find in the Action Network app about the Magic's interest in two veteran point guards. So we're going to talk about those. And to do so, we do it with the future Jays. Joe Delera, Jim Turvey in the Action Network app as at Turvey Betts and at Joe Delera, respectively. Good to have you guys. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get to our best bets for Monday. Let's start with Jim Turvey. What are your best bets for Monday, Jim? Yeah, these are both conditional. We, you know, we chatted a little bit before the the episode. This is the doldrums of the NBA betting season right before the All-Star break. So uh, I have two and they're both conditional. So it's Luca under assists if he plays uh, and Evan Mobley over rebounds if Jarrett Allen sits. All right, I will go next. Uh, I have... What what better to do on a Monday than take the worst ATS team in basketball? Is I will take the Atlanta Hawks at twenty two and twenty seven straight up and fourteen and thirty five, a smooth twenty nine percent against the spread. I'm grabbing Hawks plus four versus the red hot Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, I'm also taking the New Orleans Pelicans first half minus five and a half versus the Toronto Raptors. Joe Delera, what are your best bets? Uh, I'm look, I'm looking at Jonathan Kaminga over 26 and a half points plus rebounds. This has been a very popular one for me lately and let's keep running it back. All right. So let's go reverse order just since we don't have any uh, crossover tonight. Uh, let's start with Joe, uh, Jonathan Kaminga over 26 and a half points and rebounds. What's yeah. the angle there? How, how has he been? Uh, why do you like the Kaminga spot? So Kaminga's been awesome, right? Like the Warriors are kind of trying to figure out what their rotations are, what exactly is working as they just struggle to kind of get into the playoff picture at this point. Um, but Kaminga has kind of finally gotten some more minutes. Um, I guess, you know, Coach Kerr got the uh, got some trust in him right now. So he's been playing really well with an expanded opportunity. And over his last nine games, uh, he's really, really been crushing it. He's playing 32.8 minutes per game, 24.6 points per game, 6.3 three rebounds per game. Uh, he's shooting over 50% from three point range, which, you know, he's not the biggest three point shooter, but that still is like complimenting his game. It's helping him get into the paint. It's helping him attack the rack. Uh, but the thing that's really important to me here is that he has a 22.8% usage rate over this nine game stretch. And he missed this against Atlanta, which 
normally you would think is like a really good matchup for him, uh, but he got into foul trouble and he actually fouled out. Um, so he played 34 minutes, but I think it was a little bit hampered in terms of his ability and able to, ability to produce. Uh, so here against Brooklyn, I like the like kind of what he brings to the court. Um, I like the fact that you know he's been able to do this. I think it's actually a little bit of a buy low opportunity. Uh, the 26 it was set at 26 and a half against Atlanta in what was like a pace up spot uh, for him, but I do like this opportunity for him being the fact that he can kind of grab the points, but he can also grab the rebounds against the Brooklyn team. That's really not a great rebounding team. Claxton's solid, uh, but overall, they are not the best rebounding team. And without Ben Simmons, I think that that really impacts their ability to not only defend him, but kind of throw some length at him, throw a little bit of different size at him. Uh, so I think that this is a little bit of a better matchup for him in this matchup against, uh, against Brooklyn. So I like the 26 and a half points plus rebounds. I would add that Brooklyn sometimes has a lot of trouble with cutters because they want to push all their defense to the exterior. Like they're a switch heavy team. And so they'll play on the outside, which means if you have good cutters, which coming is really good at uh, any variety of cuts, like that sounds um, like he'd be like, how many cuts can there be? There's a lot. Uh, th there's a stampede cut, which he's actually really, really good at good at. Um, they run a lot of actions with Curry off of that. He's gotten very good on his timing in those sequences. Also, I would say, this is the time of year you have to worry about trade stuff where it's like, are they going to play guys because they're worried about them, you know, getting yep. hurt before a trade. Um, everything I've heard is like, there's been nothing on coming. It's been dead silent over the last maybe six weeks. And now that doesn't mean he's not going to get traded. It just means that right now I haven't heard anything recently. Moses Moody, I heard a little bit there, but not, not anything on Jonathan Kaminga uh, right now. So Kaminga over 26 and a half points and rebounds for Joe. All right, let's go to Luca. If in fact, Luca Doncic does play, tomorrow which uh you, you got got to hope if you're a Mavs fan but it's because uh sun's getting real low um they're having a rough time here facing the Philadelphia 76ers who are having a much rougher time uh Sixers are ah. this open is interesting they the, the game open Sixers plus two it's down to plus one which probably is not that's probably indicative of some sort of injury thing here Jim uh but give me the cap if Luca plays why you like the assists over uh, let's just under. So actually he, Sorry, there, under. and that's, yeah, it's based around two, two players on the injury report, uh, Derek Lively and Kyrie Irving. And those are going in opposite directions. Derek Lively is out. Kyrie Irving is probable. And both of those have directional impacts on Luca's assists. So he's averaging 9.6 per game overall. Um, they hung 10.5 last game actually for him. <clears throat> I'm going to like either under either of those numbers. If he does play, um, Lively, it, it makes perfect sense. He is one of the biggest recipients of Luca's assists. And in the games that Lively hasn't played this season, Luca's averaging 8.1 assists per game. Um, it's even more notable when you go to the direct on off the court. Um, he is one of the biggest splits in terms of assists when Derek Lively's on versus off um, that I've seen of any pairing in the NBA. So overall, um, his assists per 100 go from 34.7 uh, when Lively's on to 24.4 when he's off. So that's directionally huge um and then Ky Kyrie's back Ky and Kyrie's uh the opposite when Kyrie's there Lucas shares a little bit more of the playmaking role that makes sense again you can check those those on offs at PPB stats so that's a great resource to to do some of this stuff with um and the the, the last thing is this could turn to a blow you know it is projected at a very even game right now but we saw the Sixers last game uh they run out the court I think with Embiid out there may be more of these blowouts either way in, in blowouts, Luca's uh, assist average drops as well. Usually his minutes drop pretty precipitously, either in big wins or losses. They really don't push him, um, you know, like like a Tibbs might do. So a um, couple of directional injury impacts uh, for this and and then also the potential for um, lower minutes total. So I'm, I'm looking under 10 and a half or, or even nine and a half um, if he plays on Monday. Did you pull the numbers for when Lively does not play? Did you say those in that? Yeah, he averages 8.1 in the games that Lively doesn't play. I've got it 7.8. Um, oh, so either. maybe it, I maybe even missed one there. So it's even yeah, lower. Yeah, so uh, it's, he's at 7.8 here um, without when he plays and Lively does not this season. Um, the Mavs are also terrible against the spread whenever Lively does not play. Like, I'll just yeah. say, like, I, my model likes the under here. I can't take it because without Embiid, my entire projection on the Sixers is off. Um, and also it likes the Sixers, obviously, because my numbers are going to be like, I did a manual adjustment for MB, by the way, if you're wondering, um, I took 5.2 points off. And if you're like, that doesn't seem like high enough, you can't just take out, in my opinion, you don't just take the number that a player is worth of the spread and deduct them. 
um, from like a power rating. So Embiid's actual value is 6.3, but his replacement options, Paul Reed and Mo Bamba collectively were worth about 1.1, uh, which is still like, that's a, that's a real testament to how good Embiid is that he is that big of a difference over those guys who are Paul Reed's pretty good. Yeah. So uh major downgrade for them. I still can't really get to this number, but I don't want to take it because I just don't know where the Sixers are at from a mental perspective, dealing with uh, such an altered situation for, their season uh all right jim your other cap on on this uh slate mobley over rebounds uh i am not caught up on the injury report why would jared allen be out in this one uh he had an ankle sprain that he picked up midway through last game so he's okay. he's questionable right now um so mobley is is himself coming back from an injury and he's played three of the four games since he returned his minutes total has been pretty low um they brought him in around 21 then 22 23 they're kind of slow building this um, his rebounds prop for last game was at six and a half. If if Allen is out, this this works for us in two ways. First of all, they're going to have to bump Mo- Mobley's minutes up a little bit. You probably won't get to a full minutes load, um, but my guess is he would be around that you know twenty eight twenty nine um, minutes total in order to you know make sure they have some bigs on the court there. Um, and obviously, sharing the court with Allen hurts his rebounding. Mm-hmm. Um, in the first five games this season, when Allen was out, Mobley was averaging eleven rebounds a game. Um, ever since he's been just below 10. So if we can get an, uh, a rebounds prop, six, I don't think they'll give us 6.5 again, um, but if we can even get 7, 8.5, um, I'm going to be looking to that, especially if I see some news throughout the day that says Mobley is more likely to get an increased man load if Jarrett Allen is indeed sitting. So um, I just love the double bump here of, of Allen in, in both in terms of you know increasing Mobley's minutes if Allen is out, as well as not having to share the rebounding um battle with him so um i'm be looking to keep an eye on injury news throughout the day but i'm really liking those mobile rebounds if jared allen sits you can always tell when the slate is tough because uh the future jays just immediately go to props like if there's no <laughs> size or totals on the board you know that they're just like eh, i don't really want to get involved here this is not yeah. where, <laughs> this is a gross one this is not where i parked my car this yeah. is, i'm not supposed to be here I, um however i, I being the idiot i am we'll, we'll, we'll jump straight in um let's do uh so let's talk about the hawks all right hawks have, <laughs> have one and covered three straight <laughs> joe's cracking it up because i'm about <laughs> like to the, hawks. the hawks like <laughs> the hawks the, wor- the worst ats team um in in basketball um and i i gotta need to check this real quick to see i'm pretty sure that they are still uh just to confirm this real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're still on pace for the worst ATS margin in uh, ATS record in <laughs> at least since 2003. Yeah, uh, they're at 28.6%. That, that by the way, is a, a good over four and a half points worse than the second worst ATS team, which, which was the Orlando Magic in 2003, who went 26, 52, and four. Yeah. Uh, so got to buy them low, right? Uh, but look, they've won three straight, and this is actually much more about the spot for the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, so here's the deal. Teams, the, this is the last game of the road trip. Clippers are going home after this. They play They play in Miami. Tonight as we're recording this on Sunday. They play tomorrow, as you're listening to this today, in Atlanta. And then they get to finally go home all the way across country. Been on a long road trip, successful road trip for them. Teams in that spot lose about 70% of the time straight up. Win loss, like favorites are obviously going to do better. Dogs are going to do slightly worse, but the dogs perform better. Uh, or the dogs for, for perform slightly worse than they should. The favorites perform slightly worse than they should. Um, based off of overall favorite and dog numbers. Here's the the big key because I wanted to look at this particular one. The Clippers played Friday in Detroit. Flew into Miami that night, had all day Saturday off, beat the Heat on Sunday, and then traveled overnight. Traveled a short flight now after this game. They'll be in with more than enough time to go out in Atlanta. Now, look, this is a veteran squad, and they live in L.A. It's not like they're like dying to go somewhere that's nice. They live in L.A., for God's sakes. But I wanted to look at when you're on a road trip, West Coast teams going east, Road trip of at least four games or more. Next game's at home. Last game of the road trip, and you just played Miami. 
what's the record on on a back to back? And the answer is those teams are two and eight straight up, three and seven for thirty percent against the spread on that second night of a back to back. This isn't necessarily a South Beach flu performance trend. This is more the Clippers have been dynamite and they just got a win versus a very like the the reigning Eastern Conference champions. The Heat may not seem like a good team this season, but teams are going to treat them seriously and they got the win versus them. They're now going into Atlanta into what is a pretty big trap spot here in my opinion on the last game. They are a road favorite. I get Atlanta as a home dog. Don't get me wrong, Atlanta has been dog shit as a home as a home team this season, so I'm not like excited about that. Um but but if we look at the overall kind of like function here, I do think that there is like the Hawks are playing a little bit better. I watched that game last night versus the Warriors. They're playing a little bit better. The matchup's not bad. They got a lot of versatility. That's enough to get me on board here. I'm taking the spot. Joe, why am I crazy for tell me what could possibly go wrong with taking the Atlanta Hawks here? I mean, the Hawks just they just haven't been very good. Um, and like honestly, like the, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for I, that I breaking news. <laughs> I think the other problem is honestly, it's this that the Clippers just have been um just wrecking teams like like they just are rolling through like everybody um the one thing i will look at though i wonder if paul george is gonna sit um you know he you know he's been kind of on a minutes limit like he's kind of been having his minutes managed a little bit lately um he hasn't he hasn't played 30 minutes since uh since like january 21st so i wonder if you know maybe he doesn't play today or something like that and that could obviously impact the impact the line a bit too so i do understand the the spot and then you know uh they do have Zubach back but I don't know if he plays considering he just came back from injury so I think that what you're getting at like makes a lot of sense and you know especially with you know Jalen Johnson uh DeJounte Murray they do have like some athletic wings there that can kind of give the uh the Clippers some problems okay Okay, Joe so I appreciate this I do but I'll just say this you don't have to try and justify this. Like <laughs> a simple no why would, would, is fine here. Um, by the way, the Clippers this season as a as a road favorite are twelve and four straight up, ten and six, sixty three percent against the spread. Oh, I'm sorry, that's now eleven and six because they just beat the Heat as a two and a half. They beat point Miami. <laughs> I didn't bet them in that game because um, I like the spot and I like the number. I will say if you're asking if you're like your power rating can't like this, you are correct. I'm actually trying to play <laughs> power rating a little bit less. I'm trying to play more trends. It was a decision I made in preseason that like I think power rating takes you um, once you're st- you, you can get a good one by mid November. I think that I think that carries you all the way through basically the middle of January. But once we're into this time, things get too wonky, and I think you start need to rely on yeah spots and trends and things like that Um, i do think too though matt like your point your point like the atlanta plays fast it's the end of a road trip like this is probably like the one time where it's like you could kind of get them maybe like a little gassed like it's just it's a tough spot i think situationally that so that's why it's hard to get i can't you can't talk me like i can't talk you off of it i don't think yeah but also like I would also say that that maybe um, given that it's the the worst ATS team in history, maybe making it a best <laughs> bet is a little bit much. Maybe I should have just make it a good bet. Like good bet. wouldn't <laughs> bet best is probably strong here. What were you saying, Jim? Uh, I'm like very much of two minds when it comes to this game because I do think the absolute like pause, zoom out, look at this game, and be like, will the Clippers beat the Hawks by fourth? Yes, they will. But I am with you very much in. That I think it's a, a really rough schedule spot, and this is the time of the calendar to start to look for spots a little bit more. And I do think that you know that the that final game of the of the long road trip um, with the Hawks having played a little bit better, and the Hawks, to be honest, in in a position where they are you know desperate right now, their season is hanging on basically by a thread. Uh, I so I, I I can I it is one of those where I was very much of two minds, and it's why I didn't settle on either direction for it. But I don't think you're fully fully crazy. I think maybe. I would even look if I were going to be on the Hawks, I think I would look at a money line or maybe even like an alt spread because we thought like this could be a perfect like, all right, we're down. We're down 15 in the second quarter. You know what? We're going home. Let's just wrap this thing up like Hawks by, you know, 15 or something like that by the end of the game. So I think maybe even that as a, you know, we've talked about the blowout nature of this season. I think that might be a look that I, you know, I sprinkle more than I do a best bet on the direct spread. Yeah, uh, I do have a, a bet on the on the money line. Um, 
it, I think the problem with the alt concept here is that that requires like when a very good schedule spot Hawks maybe <laughs> win by margin in a very good spot versus a good team. Oh no no no! <laughs> now we're asking a lot. <laughs> now we're asking a lot of Atlanta. Uh, other one I've got for you is the Pelicans first half minus five and a half. Uh, Julian Edlow tipped me off on this when he was um, we were on Betstream last week. That the Pelicans are the second best ATS team first half in the league. Uh, in the, the behind the Boston Celtics, the Pelicans are 13, 30, I'm sorry, 31, 17, and one ATS first half at home this season. The Pels are 16, seven, and one at uh, with a 31% ROI via evanalytics.com. So that was my starting point for this. And then I decided to take a look at um, how the Pels have done in the first half when they're facing an opponent on a back to back. And the Pels have faced ten, uh, opponents 10 times a season when they're on a back-to-back, -back, when the opponent is on a back-to-back. -back. And the Pels have won eight of them by an average of 13 points. So eight of 10 is good, small sample. I'm actually more interested in the margin because that we do, like, winning isn't going to get me there. I got to cover the five and a half first half. Raptors on a back-to-back. On a -back. Uh, don't think it's a good matchup for them. They're actually pulling off a, a shocker here versus the Thunder as we record this currently, they're uh, they're still leading versus. Oh, oh nope, 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 nope. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, never mind. Just, <laughs> never just mind. They come. <laughs> just just pulled down on that screen, and it's ninety one all. But uh, uh, OKC to Houston is not a. Uh, I'm sorry, to New Orleans is not a long ride, but uh, it's also not a good spot. So I'll take the Pels first half minus five and a half versus the Raptors. Any uh, thoughts on that one? I like it. I like that one a lot. I, I really I like this. I think I'm go ahead, Jim. I think I'm going to tell you there, Matt, um, the Pelicans, I, yeah, the Pelicans first half has been one of those spots that I, I, it's like one of those where they are the second best team against the spread. And I somehow am like two and four when I have bet their first half spreads. But I, I think again, if we're talking in small sample, that's, that's not going to scare me off. I, they're a really good first half team. Um, Toronto is not a good first half team. You quoted um, EV Analytics if you use that site for to look at first half splits. Toronto is among the the bottom tier in that group as well. So um, I, I really like this. I'm, I'm almost certainly going to be tailing you when we uh, hang up here. Hooray! 11 and 14 yeah. ATS on the road first half are the Raptors. What do you think, Joe? I like it too. Um, I think it's just one of those good spots. Uh, I think the Raptors are just like trying to figure it out they you know you never know like maybe they have people that get traded too like you really like they're one of those teams that i think there are a lot of rumors about and like what exactly is going to happen rj barrett came back uh today um you know at the time that we're recording this you have to see if he's even going to play in this game too whether that's good or that's bad it depends on probably whether or not you're a knicks fan um <laughs> so i i do think that that's it's definitely a spot that you know you want to you want to try to take advantage of and i feel like with the pelicans they're one of those teams that's best like when they can just run on the offense like i think in the beginning of games you don't get into that like late off like late game offense like hero ball type thing like when they're just playing like loosely and freely i think that that's kind of when they're best and i think that checks out with the first half numbers and the fact that they're number two in net rating in the first half okay uh this will do it for our best bets for monday we've got jonathan kaminga over 26 and a half points and rebounds from joe delera we've got luca under on assists versus the philadelphia 76 years if he plays wait for that and uh evan mobley over rebounds if jared allen does not play those are courtesy of jim uh i've got the atlanta hawks plus four come join me uh on <laughs> on the ultimate <laughs> adventure betting the hawks uh and i've got the pelicans first half minus five and a half all right uh, joel and bead we talked about this with sean on thursday and for friday's episode and we got an update so we're going to go ahead and talk about it now again um adrian mozeraski reports uh this is the latest from him that via espn.com philadelphia 76 star joel and bead the reigning league mvp will undergo a procedure to address a left meniscus injury in the coming days, the team announced on Sunday night, and the, quote, door isn't closed, end quote, on a return this season, sources told ESPN. Embiid is expected to miss an extended period of time, but a more precise timeline isn't expected until doctors complete the procedure. Okay. This is confusing. 
for a number of reasons. They're going to try it. Now, look, a lot of this is that I'm going off of the information that I've known for 15 years. And the funny thing about science is it gets better. Uh, and so it's like things change here. Um, it used to be that if you repaired a meniscus, that was it. You're done. Like they're doing sutures. You're done for the duration. There is like, you are not coming back. That's a month's injury. Like he would be ready to go in like July based off of my understanding of, of that repair. If you remove it, you can come back in six months. The problem is that there's the long-term health outcomes for removal of the meniscus are worse. Now, I always kind of go like, that's what we said about Chris Paul. Like Chris Paul had both meniscuses worked on and one of them removed. And it was supposed to be like, yeah, there's no way Chris Paul is going to play past like 33. G guess what? Chris Paul's still playing and he's <laughs> coming up on like 39. So, but Chris, but Chris also like went vegan is a guard. Like that's entirely different than Joel's yeah. body size. That's not conditioning. That's just body size. Okay. So it's probably, and I do want to stress this, that like, I'm glad that they're making whatever that I, I am glad that at least he's willing to do the kind of procedure that can get him the long term because no amount of my like consternation about the MVP discussion of Joel changes the fact that if you've been to All Star and if you see some of the legends walking around, a lot of those dudes look like it is absolute like it hurts them to walk because of what the game does to their bodies, especially the big guys. And so, like, it's awesome that they're, that they're taking this kind of proactive approach because quality of life is significant here. That said, um, Jim, I'll kind of turn to you. I have some thoughts on stuff I want to I want to bet as far as like how this goes now because I was looking at something. Um, but I don't really know. Like this, I would say like this. This does not mean the Sixers are out because we just don't know yet. I kind of think he's done. But apparently they don't want to close that door. And I will say, in my experience, it's been rare that a player has this type of procedure in season this late that they say he could return, and he doesn't. Like, usually, if it's a – Jamal Murray was out for the <laughs> entire year, and they were like, he'll be back at some point this season, and then, like, there was no update. Um, there was never, like, an expectation placed on Jamal to return that season after this sounds a little bit different though um what are your kind of reactions to this news and, and how we go about approaching his betters yeah i was pretty surprised to see that it was getting repaired and it wasn't a full like just done you, you know see you next year kind of thing um i think maybe part of that is optimistic thinking about you know like like you said you know if it is repaired that's going to take you until July. So maybe they're saying like, oh, well, now it's a little quicker. It's May, June. In case this team somehow goes on a magical run, we're not going to say he's he's done for the season. But to the best of my knowledge as well, it was kind of a, a, a relative binary of if if it's repair, probably not getting him this year. If it's remove, might see him, but it's not going to be full health. So I am, I'm pretty pleased, honestly. I, I think it is good that they, they had the long-term picture. This, this was the best they had been looking, but they'll, they'll still have Nick Nurse next year. Tyrese Maxey, his breakout's not going anywhere. What, what pops to me as a better is our Tyrese Maxey MIP stock is, you know, as, as good as ever. Um, to me, I think it's basically in, in, the only thing that can stop it now is an injury. And you, you knock on wood, didn't you say that, right? But he, the usage bump that he's going to get, I mean, we saw him score, uh, I think he cleared 50. I think he was at 49 and cleared 50 with a couple of free throws. Or He was right in that range, you know, the other day with without Embiid. His usage is going to be very high. I think he's a lock for, for MIP now. Um, obviously, the MVP race, this has a lot of impact on. Uh, we might chat that in a little bit, but, it, you know, it, it, Jokic is now a heavy favorite. And But I, I think it might open the door, you know, even for a Giannis or a Shea. Um, that, that conversation is more interesting now, but... Just from a Sixers perspective, I because they have been so vague, I and because they have been vague in the past and communications maybe aren't their strongest skill at all times, um, I'm, I'm going to be in a wait and see perspective. I'm not going to go hammer a, a miss the playoffs. I'm not going to go, you know, hammer a win total under. Um, I would, I think it, there's, I think, unless I'm mistaken, there's no way he'll be back for the regular season. So I think we'll have to look at that look at things from that angle in terms of if you wanted to do a win total. But I, honestly, I, I'm fine sitting in that market out right now and just seeing and assessing until we get to the postseason to see um, what news has come out since then. It's tough because I kind of said, you know, I, I said before 
but when he first suffered the injury, I was like, look, if he's if they say he's going to return, you can wait and get the Sixers at a really good price, and then you can bet them. But like this news is so ambiguous, Joe. It we is. It's anything. tough. We can't do anything with this news, Joe. Like we have to just like leave this. We have to kind of like take the Sixers and like put them to the side and just be like, well, we'll see. We'll see about you later. That's all we can really do right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing and the most telling thing is going to be the fact that the trade deadline's on Thursday, right? So Daryl Morey, yeah. like famously said, you know, if you have a 5% chance to win the NBA title, you do everything to win the NBA title. So I can't imagine that he thinks that the team has a 5% chance to win the NBA title. So I think it'll be interesting to see what exactly they do with some of these pieces that they have um, that, you know, could potentially either get, you know, maybe get something in return right now uh, where they don't like totally fall off a cliff, um, you know, and just got you know some of these role players like you know like you have Batum you have Tobias Harris you have uh you know DeAnthony Melton like you have a bunch of pieces that I, I'm very curious to see what Philadelphia does with them um I do agree with the fact that you can't bet into this market right now I do think that it does lock up for sure MIP for Maxi uh just because his numbers are going to be insane I think the rest of the season as a number one option uh where the offense is really like built around him um but I do think that for the MVP market uh it, it's it's definitely one that i think you can kind of get into like get into a little bit more now because there is just a heavy favorite uh in Jokic, and i think a lot of us have Jokic mvp tickets at plus numbers so i do think it gives you the opportunity now to look at it and say all right uh i have this i have this ticket is there somebody else that i want to add now because of the fact that you know, maybe Jokic like tails off or maybe he doesn't really do anything super spectacular besides like what he normally does. Right. But then somebody else makes like a crazy push. Like if you see Oklahoma city as the one seed, uh, if you see Dallas, like suddenly skyrocket, uh, if you see the Knicks take over the one seed in the East. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that there's, you know, I do think that there is a little bit of room here, um, for somebody else that could really kind of pop. Uh, I, I do think that, you know, I think Jim, you mentioned Giannis. I think that that's definitely like an, look uh you know new coach uh they definitely are one of the teams that you know you feel like has that ceiling and Giannis obviously puts up the numbers um so if you know if somebody was looking for a different way to go with a vote um it's I think it's a little bit more like hazy uh it's like all right well like, if you don't want to vote for Jokic then it's not just like very clear cut that you know like before it was like well you're gonna vote for Embiid now like there's a little bit of a, a little bit more of a pool of players that I think could you know kind of make a climb and really make a push to kind of get into the conversation well and I was looking at out because as soon as Doc took over I wanted to see how the usage splits went between Dean and Giannis and I was kind of bummed Giannis is actually very small sample, so I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but his usage has dropped a little bit because around the time of the Embiid injury and, and the coaching switch, I was like, oh, this could be a really good time to get in on Giannis. Mm -hmm. At least early, the, the usage isn't as high under Doc, so I, I'll probably sit it out for now, but it's something that I am at least cognizant of. And, you know, Dame was on the injury report today, questionable. Uh, he ended up playing, but if he misses any time, that's obviously going to skyrocket Giannis's usage. That's the, that's the name that popped to me to keep an eye on. I'm, I'm not... I'm not making a move yet, um, but that was the one name that that I kind of thought could could make a move. Just because Luca's almost at the point of he can't miss any more games now either quietly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's the one to look at, but not bet yet. So there's a plus six fifty in the market on Giannis and a plus nine hundred. Um, I do think the nine hundred in particular is a really good value. That's actually at our partner BetMGM. You can get him plus nine hundred to win MVP if you're like me and you have Jokic and Shea kind of covered. Um, yeah, Shea is still. I can say I. I like Shea. But I, the here's the thing, the Jokic number I don't think is right because the Jokic number is definitely like the books are still like Denver's power rated higher. Denver's like the better team. Denver should win the one seed or finish above OKC at least. And I'm kind of like I don't think I think it's way much way more of a coin flip. Like I don't I I do think that whoever winds up getting one that's going to matter. I think whoever wins more games is going to matter a lot in this. Joe picked up on the other thing. We talked about this. Uh, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before. And we talked about the New York Knicks and about how it's like, you got to wait for like the right time to get it. I was not expecting this to happen. And so now uh, I will say, so like, let me set this up for you. What I said previously was I like the Knicks to make the conference finals. If they can avoid Boston in the bracket that's the most important key is i need to be like i think they will tear up M milwaukee's drop scheme 
Um, I like them in a full seat, full strength matchup versus the Sixers. I was very high on the Sixers. I have a lot of features that are now not, not great on <laughs> Philadelphia. Cause I really like the way that they match up with those teams. I like the coaching advantage. There is a very strong possibility that the New York Knicks can avoid both Boston and Miami in their bracket. And that sets up extremely well for a team that is currently at our partner bet MGM, uh, eight to one to win the Eastern conference. I don't think I like the, the title odds are 22 to one and sure. Like that gets you a nice juicy number. You can hedge out of later. I'm also just kind of like, I don't know. Like, I think it is like, that's good. That, that seems appropriately priced to me. Cause I'm going to like pretty much any team that comes out of the West yeah. versus the Knicks. Yeah. Um, but I like that setup very much. So dunks and threes just uh, came out with in the last like three weeks, they have a playoff probabilities and they're the same over at basketball reference, essentially. And um, schedule adjusted. That's the difference here is that these are schedule adjusted. The Knicks have a 52.3% chance. So just over 50% of being the two or the three. That is very good. That is like, that is, that is a very good number. Now, currently they've got like the Cavs at like 38% to be the two seed. And that's probably like, they, like me, are at that spot. If you're like, where's Milwaukee? That's the thing is like both dunks and threes and like the numbers I run are both like Milwaukee's not that good. Cleveland's actually better, but Cleveland just, or Milwaukee just keeps doing this annoying thing called winning games. So it <laughs> keeps them ahead in the market. Um, I do think, Jim, that <laughs> this has provided an opportunity where I think the Knicks are, are getting the two seed. I think the Knicks are live to make the conference finals. And eight to one is an appropriate price for me to bet into. So I'm going to bet the New York Knicks to win the Eastern Conference at eight to one. Yeah, it's funny. Last week we were on here and I said, yeah, you don't have to rush on a Knicks number. It's not going to get much below 10 to 1. Did not foresee <laughs> the Embiid news that has now brought it below 10 to 1. Um, but I am kind of at the same point where now, you know, the information has changed. And now I don't think it's going to move much below 8 to 1. So I am, you know, I, maybe someone will go out with injury and I'll look silly again because the number will move again. But I still think this is a weight and see to make sure that the bracket plays out. Because I do think the Cavs and Bucks are legitimate threats to get the two and three. You know, you said Nick's slightly over 50%, but that also means, you know, there's a 47% chance mm -hmm. that they land in that four seed area, four or five area. And then the, the path becomes a lot trickier. So I think once again, I'm going to wait. I still like this Knicks team. I even, you know, I think I like the way they match up with Boston maybe more than some others. So okay. I really, I, I am in on the Knicks, but I am once again um, going to wait and see how things play out. Joe, my our resident Knicks cheerleader, <laughs> what, 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 is, what is your thought on this? By the way, I, I, I hold on. We got to confront this because this is an intervention. <laughs> Joe, we got to stop with the Jalen Brunson MVP stuff. We get, we got to, <laughs> we got to stop. Buddy. Look, all he needs stop. is Jokic, Tatum, Luca, Shea to all miss games. That's all we need, <laughs> and we got it. <laughs> we already got one of them out, and beads out. So <laughs> we're like one eighth of the way there. No, but I Luka mean, Luca has a higher. Luca has a higher earned wins on dunks and threes. Or I'm sorry, uh, LeBron has a higher EW on dunks and threes. Oh, don't get me started. I, I can start a lebron mvp narrative right now we won't do that no but I, I i think that what jim kind of mentioned like i don't hate their matchup against uh boston I, they've kind of played them pretty tough they went up they've lost um but they have played them tough um i do think that having oj yananobi is super significant and then i think that having isaiah hartenstein really like develop this year like it like he just kind of totally change like he's he's completely evolved as a player this year um i think that that is was so significant especially for the playoffs because mitchell robinson amazing just immediately in foul trouble all the time so i think that now like if you have both of them healthy 
for the playoffs. I think that really helps your flexibility. It helps you like if you do get into foul trouble, I, I think that they are going to be one of those teams that like you don't want to face in like in the Eastern Conference playoffs. I do think that there could be some jockeying around for playing Philadelphia. Um, because I don't like, obviously we don't know what the extent of Embiid's injury is. I, I mean, if he does come back, what's he going to come back like for the playoffs kind of rough, I would say. Um, I, I think that there could be some jockeying around Philadelphia hasn't been good. I think they're going to fall, um, in the East, but that could mean that, you know, it's even more important to get the two seed or it's more important to get the three seed where you wind up playing, uh, where you could wind up playing Philly in that first round. Um, so I do think there's going to be some jockeying around. I like, I like New York. Like I, I, I just don't see the number changing like too much. I mean, they've been playing incredibly, but I think kind of what Jim has said, cause like, I obviously have my Homer bets on the Knicks from like before the season started, but like, so for me, it's maybe <laughs> a little bit different, but I do think that what Jim said about seeing the bracket um, probably is helpful because I don't, I just really don't see a scenario where they, you know, like where, where they're not going to be like at least the third best odds. Like, I don't think they're going to see, you're going to see better odds on the Knicks than the Bucks or the Celtics or maybe even the Cavs before the playoffs start. Um, so I do think that, you know, there is an opportunity there to just kind of wait, see what happens, see how the Randall injury uh, kind of works out, see how he comes back, see if they get Mitchell Robinson. Maybe that shortens the price a little bit, but you're definitely going to be in a much more certain position in terms of like how strong of a contender they actually are. But I do like what you said about betting them for the East as opposed to the title. Um, I think that the mat like against the East, I can poke holes in a lot of the matchups and a lot of the teams that they would play because I think a lot of these Eastern Conference teams are really flawed. Even Boston, with the fact that how they take so many threes, which like I get it, it's they're amazing at it but it also like gives it like introduces the opportunity for bad teams to beat you if you just yeah. run cold so I, I i it's it's a concern that i have for boston but against like a, the best team that comes out of the west it's a completely different ball game completely different animal i just want to make sure that our producer clubs you saying i like new york i just want to like get that <laughs> <laughs> You know. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> elsewhere, I I dropped a what the kids are calling a slop article over the weekend that talks about the latest in trade talks. And I've got a lot of different um, things in there. Uh, Tyus Jones who talks to the Timberwolves. They have interest there. That'd be a really interesting pickup for them. A uh, little bit of stuff on the Warriors. Andrew Wiggins and the Mavericks. Uh, the Warriors and Mavericks have talked about Andrew Wiggins over the last couple of weeks. I think that's an interesting one. But the one we're going to talk about before we get out of here um, has to do with the Southeast Division, which the Orlando Magic have been trying to get a point guard for sometime at bet mgm king of sports books the miami heater minus 140 the magic are plus 100 and the hawks are 40 to 1 um have i mentioned the hawks are the worst atsd <laughs> history your uh, birds yeah, my, <laughs> uh, so the magic last trade deadline i reported that they were one of the teams that was really interested in fred van vliet and they couldn't get a deal done and Masai decided to go ahead and let that let the pet sh sail by, and Fred leaves for Houston. And Orlando tried to get in that conversation for FVV and couldn't. Flash forward to this year, uh, they are still looking at options. They've they've like every time a point guard has come available, my understanding is that Orlando has called. I've heard I have consistently heard them whenever a point guard comes up. So they are one of the teams that has the cap space and enough expiring contracts and enough players to be able to make a larger move and take on a large salary. The Charlotte Hornets took on Kyle Lowry for Terry Rozier and are now in a spot where my understanding is that there, hmm, there is a very good chance that Lowry will not be bought out because there will not be an agreement on the amount for his buyout. Hmm. If you get what I'm saying, um, which is why, as you can imagine, Charlotte pretty motivated to trade him. And so <laughs> Orlando is a team that's willing to be like, we could really use a Kyle Lowry. We'll give up assets to me. Like they're like the number one team that this makes sense for. Um, if he's bought out, I think he goes to either the Lakers or the Sixers. Those are the two teams that I think he winds up with. If the mat, if the, the, Hornets decide to pay out the remainder of his contract. He's on an expiring. If they pay out the full amount, the Sixers or Lakers is kind of where I expect to head up. Like, obviously, connections to Philly, 
Lakers make a lot of sense for a lot of reasons because guess what? Veteran players really like LA. Um, but Orlando is really interesting as a trade target there. The other team is the Warriors because um, my, my wife keeps being like, how does this happen to Chris Paul? Like the Warriors are the best team in basketball <laughs> for a decade. He goes there and now they're bad. How does he get screwed like this? And like Chris hasn't even been bad. Uh, but the Hornets are also, or the Magic rather, I think are also interested in, in taking on Chris Paul. Um, a lot of this has to do, I think, with the fact that they did not extend Markel Fultz. And so they're going to have to come to an agreement on a new deal with him. And so I don't know where they're at in that process. I had heard previously that like Wendell Carter Jr. was a little bit available. I think that's changed. I think the Magic are back to no. But Jonathan Isaac is available. And they have uh, a veteran player in Joe Ingles that a lot of these teams would like to be to have on roster. So, um, Joe, I'll ask you, I, I like, I mean, I just like Orlando a lot. Miami's really, Miami's really volatile. I don't want to make a bet until the deadline. This is one of those where I don't want to make a bet in advance of a trade. I generally tend to now advocate against that. You should not try and like read the tea leaves. But if the Magic were to acquire one of those guys, how what impact do you think they would have on Orlando, both night to night futures, and if you got any prop angles too? I think night to night it would probably be most impactful, right? Just having another vet there, like especially as the season kind of continues to grind, and I think the expectation it gets like higher, right? And I think that having that in Orlando would be like really important, like having a vet that could kind of join the team and say like, look, like we're still grinding. Like it's not like the other years where you're kind of out of it um, and you're just trying to wait till the, you're getting on a golf course or you're going to Cabo or like whatever. Like it's it's much more of a grind at the end of the season when you're playing other teams that have stakes, like you need to get out there and continue to play. So I think that that might matter. I do think that from like an assist perspective, um, I think that it might would probably impact like Franz Wagner, Paolo uh, to a degree. Like I think maybe you see their assists drop a little bit as they have to, as maybe they don't have to control and run the offense as much. Um, so that's maybe an angle that I would look at. Um, but I, at the same time, it might, it maybe it helps the spacing just a little bit if they get a guy like uh, if they get a guy like Lowry who can hit a couple threes, um, or you know if they get Chris Paul, I think the biggest thing would be pace. So Orlando already plays like at a relatively slow pace. Um, I would imagine that it gets even slower if they're giving meaningful minutes to Chris Paul, um, who generally just like slows everything down, breaks it down. They're playing at the twenty first pace in the league. It wouldn't surprise me to see them drop even more to maybe like bottom five, bottom six. Uh, and I think that naturally has an effect on player props for both the Magic and for their opponents, uh, given the fact that, you know, there's just fewer possessions. So you can't look at it the same way um, if you're seeing like maybe two or three fewer possessions per game. Orlando's 27 and 23 with a plus one adjusted net rating. Miami is 26 and 24 now, one back in the loss column with a minus 1.1, and yet they're still favored here, Jim. Um, I have some thoughts on if this trade goes through that we'll get to in a second, but uh, what are your kind of thoughts on if Orlando makes one of these types of moves? Yeah, so this is actually, we gave out this Orlando divisional bet on the podcast a while ago, I believe, um, and mm -hmm. it was nice to see Orlando officially move past them in the standings because for a while what has been happening is the Heat have been the second luckiest team by cleaning the glass in terms of actual uh, wins in the win column this season, and the Magic still have the easiest remaining schedule. So those two factors have most of the projection <laughs> systems really leaning heavy towards Orlando taking the division. Um, now, there is a little bit of you know fear that Miami could make a big move at the deadline. I, I haven't heard a lot of chatter about that. I think it's more just that the Miami boogeyman is out there and, and they do kind of come out of nowhere sometimes. Um, but I still like this Orlando division bet. If you didn't get it then, I still like it at plus money now. Um, but I think I agree with you, Matt, that I think I, what I most want to do is wait for the deadline, see if anything crazy happens. I don't think the number's going to move drastically. Um, the number has been off of the projection systems all year for Orlando and Miami. So wait, make sure Miami doesn't pick up anyone crazy. And then I would hit the uh, Orlando division, which theoretically should be around plus money, uh, maybe a slight minus at that point anyways. I kind of, I, I almost say kind of lean the other way. If Miami doesn't do anything drastic at the deadline and the market overreacts the way that it always does to a trade, like if they add, I don't think it will happen if they add Kyle Lowry, but if they add Chris Paul, there might, there might actually be a significant bump 
to Orlando's uh, power rating and projection by the books. And then we do get Miami a plus number, and you did get Orlando at a plus number, depending on well, what that value too. Yep. Got there. Yeah. Uh, there might be an opportunity. I'm just I'm always in favor of go the other direction in the hours after a trade, and then once it starts to work, buy back in. Like just yeah, that's a very whenever, good point. Whenever this is like a very important thing for futures betters, do not bet into the market immediately after a significant trade. Like in I fact, know it's like <laughs> look for the edge and do the, do yeah, the find <laughs> the overreaction and hit the opposite. That's I a mean, very our, good point. Yeah. Our big one last year was um after the Kevin Durant trade, we gave out Lake or Nuggets. That was what Brandon and I did. Like yeah, we yeah. all like we all went in on and Joe was there too. We all went out on Nuggets as soon as they made that Kevin Durant trade. And we got a really good price on it. Um the last thing on Miami, I'll say. Carefully, uh, <laughs> I want to be very clear. I have, I do not have anyone like, I don't have any source there to be tell me like Pat Riley's not calling me up and being like, let me tell you what I'm gonna do. So this is reading tea leaves, okay? Uh, there's been a lot of noise as happens when a team loses seven games in a row as they recently did, okay? Uh, they have a large salary bill. Even though they made the fi the finals last year, there's like, a, okay, we were 500 last year and we're 500 again. What 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 are we doing? Um, and I will say that online outlets like Five Reasons Sports, which is led by Ethan Skolnick, who's a longtime reporter there, have started at least discussing the possibility, hypothetically, of major changes to that roster. The reason I bring this up for you as like a futures better is this is not like you need to get past the deadline. My big thing here is do yeah. So you need to make sure that you do not bet into the heat before the deadline. You can do it. I'm fine if you look. I bet them to win the title in preseason because I was like, I don't like any of these East teams. I'm, I'll take Spo again. You got to wait till after the deadline in order to get in on the heat. Uh, all right, that's got to do it for buckets. My thanks to Joe Dallaire and Jim Turvey, the future Jays. Appreciate the joining me. Uh, Jim is on Twitter and in the action network app at Turvey bets. Joe's at Joe Dallaire. My thanks to David Payne, our producer in his last week before a well-earned vacation, getting this episode up. My thanks to our video team over at the action network for putting this on youtube.com slash the action network. I know you guys put in a lot of hours on this and I really appreciate the work done. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with best bets with, Andrew O'Connor Watts, as well as Jay Money. Make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you're listening. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you guys again next time. Until then, let's get buckets.